Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I am Brian Carrington, and you're listening to Call Talk for Wednesday, October 27th, 2010. Our topic today is on customer and agent loyalty. Five questions you need to ask yourself before you leave work tonight. If you're listening live right now, we invite you to become a part of the show and ask questions. You can do it a few different ways. Number one, you can email us at calltalk at benchmarkportal.com, or you can chat with us on calltalk.tv, which some of you already are doing. You can also call in and ask us a question and correspond with our co-host today, and that phone number is here, 347 347- Eight five seven three one one seven. All right, so make sure you press the number one on your phone to let me know that you have a question and want to actually be on the air. Okay, everyone who asks a question today, either through the email or phone on the show, will receive a free copy of Bruce's book, Benchmarking at its Best, and one person will be chosen at random to win an in-depth reality benchmark report valued at $1,500. Also, as a special treat today, we have some other books to give away from our special co-host today. We'll talk more about that in just a second. But I do want to remind everyone that possibly you're not listening live. You're listening to one of our archive shows, and thank you for doing that. And for everyone's information, you can do that anytime you want. Just go to calltalk.tv anytime and check into some of our previous shows. A lot of great information there. So now it is my pleasure to introduce the host of Call Talk, Bruce Belfiore. Thank you very much, Brian, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. Today's topic is customer and agent loyalty, and today we have an expert on the topic for you, Gene Bliss. Now, Gene has a great background for customer service. Uh, Being the third of seven kids raised in Chicago, her dad owned a Buster Brown's shoe store. Remember those? Uh, Where she got her first job running into the stockroom for shoes, ringing the register, and unloading boxes. Later, she worked at Land's End alongside founder Gary Comer, helping create a service culture and customer experience not so far from what she learned at her dad's store. And we all know that Land's End is considered among the best in customer service. Since then, Jean has led customer loyalty efforts for over 25 years inside America's top corporations. And now through her own company called Customer Bliss, She coaches leaders on how to wrap their company's focus around the customer experience and customer profits and has authored two outstanding books, Chief Customer Officer and the other, I Love You More Than My Dog. (laughs) (laughs) I'm delighted to welcome our guest, Jean Bliss. Hey, Bruce. Good morning. Okay, great. Well, well, Jane, before we get into the uh, really serious stuff, uh-huh. I have to ask you about your latest title. And yep. uh, Brian said, uh, Bruce, is Call Talk going to the dogs? <laughs> Very funny, Brian. So <laughs> anyway, I responded by bringing my dog, Stella, just for the occasion. So say hi to our listener, Stella. Okay, of course. She's licking my hand now. But anyway, I love Stella, uh-huh. and she loves me, except when Stella decides every once in a while to have a little accident on the carpet, in which case we kind of go to our separate corners and glare at each other. But most of the time, <laughs> it's really good. And uh, my friend and colleague, uh, who you know, Professor Richard Feinberg at Purdue, I remember one conversation he told me that his dog is, quote, the only one in the world who gives me unconditional love. <laughs> so, oh, so, well, that's... You know, I think, <laughs> so I think your title will strike a chord with a lot of us. And if you could just open the cover of your book for our listeners, Gina, and tell us about this fun pooch analogy. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's got it's got it's really got two pivots to it. One is, um, you know, in, in the world of social media, word of mouth, where your customers tell the story to each other and customers look to each other, to their family members, their colleagues, et cetera, um, to make their buying decisions, it's about earning this kind of outlandish rave, I love you more than my dog, that we really strive for. And, and the book is about how to earn that kind of rave. But then the dog analogy connects to it because there's an emotionality that people have with their dogs, a caring attitude, you know, unrequited love. And so uh, the combination of the two, earning this kind of rave and that the rave included a dog, seems to have really 
hit the heartstrings of of a lot of people and um my publisher came up with the title which was rather brilliant i had all these really serious titles etc and they called me and they said we've got the title for your book it's i love you more than my dog so um there you go <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think it really does. It ties into what we're trying to get from our, our customers. I think a lot of people listening probably say, gosh, can I ever get that good? And uh, obviously you can't get that good with all of your customers, but maybe you can with some of your customers. And if you can, uh, then they'll talk to other people and, you know, you get that wonderful word of mouth uh, part as well. And, uh, well, well let, let's dig into the, the components that you talked about because after – your two years of research, you landed on five common decisions that what you call beloved and prosperous companies make. Uh, if you could walk us through these, I think it would be great. Sure, yeah. And, and you know what's interesting is that you don't, you don't get to this. I, I use the word beloved on purpose. This beloved status, accidentally, you have to be deliberate. And what I found was, you know, kind of grounding myself in this remarkable experience I had at Land's End, you know, where we were – honored and taken care of as employees and we pass that on to the way we took care of our customers is that when there's a fork in the road and you can move to the right which is you know whichever direction you say right or left you can move in one direction which is fastest profits cost cutting things that are right short term perhaps for the company or you can move in the direction of your customers and employees these companies always make the decision in a deliberate manner to move in the direction of their employees and customers. And it's really these five types of decisions that they make. The first is that they decide to believe. They believe in their customers and they believe in their employees and they practice this first by suspending cynicism. In other words, getting rid of the policies and procedures that really pen in customers and the amount of management oversight that creates a diminishing ability of employees to think on their feet. And by doing that, they they hire people for the long run, they train them, and then they believe in them and enable them to bring the best version of themselves to work every day. They decide mm -hmm. – um, did you want to jump – no, no, that's okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Okay, the second decision is clarity of purpose. What we know is, especially in large corporations where, you know, our organizations these days are made up of multiple types of silos, operations, marketing, sales, operations, and if we don't unite the organization – in thinking from the customer experience point of view and have clarity in what business we're in, then the execution of our operation is what the customers see, and they actually have to traverse our organization chart. And the experience is disjointed, and it's not connected. Uh, for example, I tell a story about a, a children's cup manufacturer, and a traditional product manufacturer goes out, they decide it's, a, it's time to make a new line of children's cups, and they put, bring some moms together, they have them sit around the table, and they say, pick a cup. Well, you know, maybe the mom needed a cup with an indentation in it or a straw. You know, any of those of us who are parents know that the difference between a great meal and a lousy meal is milk on the table or water on the, the floor. Well, the everyday company, I call them everyday companies, where they're looking internally for what's important to them is manufacturing cups. The beloved mm -hmm. company is supporting parenthood. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, I mean – it's sort of like the difference between uh, a lifetime mission and looking at the uh, next quarter's profits or the uh, you know the exact outlines of the next product that comes out, isn't it? Exactly. And if you're supporting parenthood, you think about product development differently. You communicate with your customers differently, and you earn the right to expand beyond that cup line to mm -hmm. multiple product categories and you grow because you begin with the customer not with the cup right right and okay. from a for example call center standpoint the folks coming in and talking to customers know that their role is support, supporting parenthood it's not just checking in logging in doing tasks we're all part of this higher mission and it elevates all of our work and what we found is the companies that really are beloved are are take the angst to be clear about this purpose, and then they align with that in every operational decision they make. Right, right. Okay, so there really needs to be some support from the top in terms of the mission statement 
And uh, there's a lot of companies that will go along with a mission statement that's committed to this sort of thing, but it's up to the uh, customer contact manager really to make sure that it's lived out in the contact center environment, right? That's right. And, and, and you know, the, the, the call center can and the co- customer contact center has one important, very, very important part of the customer experience, but that's got to live among all of the other operating areas as well. You know, product development, if it's a product company, can't start with just product development. They have to really listen to the voice of the customer, feedback from call centers, feedback from their customers, start designing differently. Um, rules and regulations and policies and procedures have to be rethought from a customer point of view. So it's this whole lining up behind what the purpose is. You know, a lot of companies go through this big mission statement thing. It's carved in rocks or on marbles or whatever it is, and and there it sits. But it's operationalizing the purpose in everyday decisions. That's the difference. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, And in those call centers where I see great things happening, it's uh, oftentimes because there is a mission statement that's on the wall and then, uh, you know, as I listen in to conversations on what to do next in terms of improvement initiatives, reference is made to the mission statement and the things in it uh, because it becomes the North Star for the, right. uh, the center. Yeah, It's the guidepost. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, back back in the day when I was at Land's End, our, you know, our, our whole thing was around, you know, what's right for the customer is what's right for all of us. And so our call center folks didn't have a talk time. You know, we... Mm-hmm. We brought the phone people, uh, the, they, they were farmers. You know, they got up at 4 in the morning and hayed the fields and plucked eggs from the underbelly of warm hens before <laughs> coming into Land's End and, and taking calls. And, and we wanted who they were to show through. And so, yep. yes, we armed them with the product information, but it was about, hey, be who you are. Talk to the customer in your own voice, in your own vernacular. And um, that was a big part of, of what grew our connection with customers as we were really uh, rising. Right, right, okay. And, and, uh, and maybe that, we'll talk a little. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, please please go ahead. No, I was just saying that uh, obviously sometimes that, for some of the people listening, uh, that will conflict with certain uh, short-term goals that their uh, managers have right now. And so, you know, maybe we can give them some strategies for, you know, actually being able to connect the senior management mission to the uh, way that they want to do their processes to actually fulfill the mission, and therefore, in some cases, maybe even convince senior management that they shouldn't be so so short-sighted, but in fact should uh, take a longer view uh, and and look toward becoming beloved instead of simply uh, getting the uh, short-term profit up. Absolutely. In fact, we just uh, I just facilitated a great call yesterday with the um, call center manager of uh, Zappos, and uh, we were talking a lot about how they were preparing their call center folks for the holiday seasons, and, and, and there's some really wonderful, whimsical things that uh, they're doing that we could chat about, too, later. And, and you, you're right. It flies in the face of the traditional metrics, you know, those things that we we almost manage by fear versus saying, gosh, if we do what's right, we're going to earn the right to this greater profitability longer term. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. Okay, good. And, and that, that connects right into the third decision, which is uh, decide to be real. These organizations get rid of the corporate packaging, if you will. The letters that come out from customer service are written in a tone of humanity and, uh, you know, like one person talking to another. When you engage with their folks, you feel a personal connection. They hire people that are humble and, um, you know, have humility. Their their leaders don't take themselves seriously. They take the business seriously. And, you know, you want to read their packing slips, even their bills, because they take the time to um, really have a voice that's all their own. And so they get rid of that bureaucracy and that corporate packaging and how they communicate with customers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's and, good. and then the, the, the fourth decision is really around Deciding to be there, operationalizing from the point of view of the customer's lives. So they really think about, <clears throat> excuse me, customer processes and what's important to customers as they build how they deliver products, how they manufacture things, how they as serve and support and, and enable the call center folks to do the right thing. 
for customers. Mm -hmm. So they operationalize first from the customer point of view. And then the fifth decision is they decide to say, sorry, excuse me. (coughs) I'm so sorry. had a little dog in my throat. You don't have to say you're sorry, and love means never having to say you're sorry, right? So. <laughs> Gosh, now we got everything in here. And, and you know what's interesting is we've as consumers, <laughs> as consumers, we've all lived through this year. It's been very interesting watching a lot of well done apologies, but also some not so well done apologies in the marketplace, and how you recover from either big incidents with your customers or the small ones that need to be nurtured and handled with care at the call center personal interaction level says more about the company and what you value than almost anything else you could encounter. You know, when a customer encounters a mistake with a company, it's not that the company made the mistake that bothers them so much. It's if they try to brush it under the rug, if they don't repair the emotional connection, if they don't say they're sorry, then right. you start saying, you know, this may not be the kind of company filled with people that I want to continue to do business with. Right. right. That's why yep. that's the fifth decision. And it's the fifth decision on purpose because um, you need to be able to believe in your people. You need uh-huh. to have clarity of purpose. You need to operationally be screening on a regular day- basis and have reliability in how you're going to be there to know when you fail. Uh, uh-huh. And you, you need to, in order to be able to say you're sorry in a human and real way. And right. so all okay. of them line up. Yeah, yeah. And actually, you know, a couple, couple of thoughts come with that. We did some research that showed, uh, and I'm not sure I've got the exact me- uh, numbers right now, but it was something like if you have uh, customers who are well-serviced on a call, et cetera, you have a 78% uh, loyalty rate. That is to say people who are per- have a propensity to repurchase from you. That's if right. If you do a bad job, it plummets to something like 30%. And on the other hand, if you have a bad experience that then is recouped really well, in other words, you go back to them, say you're sorry, and try to make it right, and in fact do make it right, the loyalty repurchase rate goes up to uh, 87%. You so bet. Fact, yeah, fact, go ahead. Yeah, no, the, 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 everyone understands that uh, the world is not an infallible place. There's always going to be problems. It's how you sort of react to the problem that makes a big difference, and uh, just as in uh, human interactions with family members, with friends, if they disappoint you, but then they make up for it, you actually feel closer to them and more loyal to them afterwards. You bet. And and what's interesting is when I when I talk to companies, I say, you know, look, don't be afraid of mistakes. They're your best opportunity to show the true colors of your company. And, and it's interesting. That's why these five decisions, as I did this research, these companies grew in good times and bad because they always let their humanity show. Deciding mm-hmm. to believe, operating from a clarity of purpose, being real and human and allowing their people to bring the best version of themselves to work. Operationalizing so customers were, had a reliable experience they could tell others about. And being humble enough to say they're sorry. Really mm-hmm. sets mm-hmm. companies apart and it starts to give you a feeling for why. You know, we read all these great case studies. We're like, oh, that's so cool. I want to be like them. But we have to do things purposefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those are all great points, Uh, really. I think there's some great takeaways for our listeners in terms of the things that you were just talking about. If I could just add one more thing to the uh, word real, uh, because I think there's, there's probably some of the listeners who are saying, gosh, my real world doesn't have that kind of support from senior managers. How can I somehow turn my situation into, uh, you know, one where I can uh, give my center and my customers the benefits that uh, that Gene is talking about and still make them happy. Yep. you have some thoughts on that? Because I, I have a couple that I could uh, throw in there. You, you want to go first? <laughs> and then I'll jump in on what you've got to say. Okay, sure. Well, and, and the thing is here, I'll, I'll make a confession that I don't always make a whole lot, and that is that uh, I actually come from a, a finance background, and I was actually a CFO at one point. So I hope nobody hangs up their phone because, you know, they, one of the oh, things that I've noticed is that, uh, you know, there's sort of a left brain, right brain thing going on with many uh, call centers in the context of their, you know, uh, their corporations. And uh, the worst day of the year is when the call center manager has to go in for budgeting because they feel like they're going to a different planet and really yep. people talking different languages. So one of the tough love messages that we've always had is you need to learn 
the language and learn the problems of the corner offices and try to address them in order to get what you need uh, for your yourself and for your center. And so if you're one of the if you're a listener who's in a center that doesn't have the kind of support that uh, Lands and Zappos others have, then how can you uh, gain what you need and, and maybe turn the corporation toward where you are and the, the higher ups? And I think uh, one of the things is to uh, take a real hard look at the corporate mission statement and see where you can actually leverage that uh, into, because most corporate mission statements do talk about good service and that the customer is the center and, uh, and focus of what you do. Take that and see how you can use that in your presentations to management. And the other thing is to uh, show them how long-term the uh, financial impacts of what you do uh, for your customers, doing the b believing, declarative purpose, being real, uh, deciding to be there for your customers and for your, uh, for your uh, agents, uh, learning how to say you're sorry and, and doing things to make up for it. All those things ultimately will be good for uh, the bottom line. And, yep. and whenever possible, taking metrics that we – uh, hold dear, first call resolution, all of that kind of thing, our FCR, our ATT, et cetera, and translating improvements into their three-letter acronyms like ROI and EPS and, and presenting them that way. And, and that that's a way of, uh, again, taking that word real that you used in number three and yep. saying, how do I make it real for me? Well, you're going to have to learn how to be what I call bilingual. In other words, how do I translate what I need into the words that are going to move the senior offices? So yeah. anyway, over to you at this point. Yeah, no, I, I think it's really powerful. I've got, I've got three points, observations, whatever to add to that, which is, you know, we know that that there are some companies who really believe and get it and are willing to, to take the leap to the investment. A lot of us, and, and after I left Lands End, clearly, I, I've been in other organizations where I had to really connect to the ROI. We know that there is an impact that a great customer interaction call has in terms of the long-term growth of a customer, and, and you can actually extrapolate customer growth after they've had call center interactions, and, and I'd say that's a really powerful you know, thing that you can also, in addition to some of the other metrics Bruce has, has talked about, um, in my first book, Chief Customer Officer, I actually call these guerrilla metrics, which is really finding two or three simple things to talk about customer growth uh, and attaching it to interactions that you've had, and, and that really will, will make your point. The, the second thing is, and, and prove the, the real value that you have, uh, the second thing is I think that we, we over – we overlook the value of the gold that comes in every day when customers interact with your folks because every day they're telling you what they like and what you don't like. And mm -hmm. you've got power there in terms of becoming a, a, a research and development engine of information that will help your company grow and prosper. So mm -hmm. if you're not already, and, and I know many already have started doing this, track and trend that customer feedback into complaints and accolades, and you now kind of become this very important real-time voice of the customer listening engine to drive improvement and actions and can actually, if you get that robust enough, reduce some of the cost of, of those outside surveys because you've got real-time feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. The third, the, did you want to jump in there, Bruce? No, no, that's great. That's great. Okay. The third point. And, and then the third point, and, and I do that with all my clients, by the way, and it, it's so important because it, it elevates the call center. Yes, you're taking calls, but you're also a major part of driving the, the company forward and, and improving and, and taking you to, to a new place. So you're part of the overall mission. And, and then the third thing kind of gets gets to what we've been talking about. You know, yes, there may be – talk times and other things, but at that moment when you're on the phone, your folks are on the phone with a customer, their whole job, and this may sound a little silly, but I believe in this with my heart and it and it really impacts, is to be a memory creator. Even if, you know, in the case of Allstate, for example, when I was there, we'd work with the claim reps. And, yes, yeah, sometimes they had to turn down a claim, but if you talk to that customer and you explain with humility and empathy why the claim is turned down, and you enable them to have a better experience next time. 
when they hang up the phone, the memory of how they were treated has everything to do with how they feel about that brand and will impact 100% how much they go forward and purchase more or tell other people about your brand. And so, you know, even though that people may may have rules and regulations or whatever around them, at that moment they own that interaction and they can choose to be a memory creator or to execute tasks. And there's power in knowing you can make that choice. Yeah. No, that's a it's a great point. That's a great point. And and to go back to your second one, which was the track and trend uh feedback. Yeah. Uh, that's another way of proving your worth to the other parts of the organization. And it, it uh, sort of fits in with what we call creating a uh, radio organization where you actually are not simply that cost center hanging off the organization. You're an right. integral part of what makes the company work. And uh, just a quick story, we were at uh, Gillette and, uh, you know, ended up talking with somebody over at the product development marketing side and uh, they said, oh, do you guys get any information there about, um, uh, you know, from women? They said, yeah, we get quite a bit. Anyway, long story short, we ended up uh, using information to develop a new product for Gillette, and they were just delighted with that. And oh, yeah. uh, there's a, the whole social media side of this we, we could get into too, but well, let's uh, take a question. Brian, I think you've got a couple of questions here. Yeah, I do, guys, and uh, I, I want to take a quick break and say uh, thank you to all our listeners, uh, some of the live listeners I know have called in. We've got some from California, some from Pennsylvania, Northeast Ohio, and you guys are on the phone, so uh, remember, if you do want to interact with the show, you just hit one so I know you want to. Otherwise, feel free to call in. You can still do this at 347-857-3117 is the call-in number. But right now, I do want to ask a question. Uh, thank you, David. This is from calltalk.tv. And his question is this to you guys. If you get rid of corporate packaging, how do you control their interaction with callers? Hmm. Okay. I'm not do you sure want to what, handle that? Well, I'm not sure what David means by corporate packaging there. Um, what I meant by corporate packaging was the kind of stiff, you know, ways that companies communicate, form letters, um, the frameworks that are very kind of uh, very specific and not agile, can't move or bend with different with different customers, um, rules and regulations. You know, we need to have some of those frameworks, but we also need to trust the front line uh, to modify and to um, you know deal with the different situations based on what they're encountering with the customer. But that begins with training and developing people so that they can make the right decisions in real time. And, uh, and I'll throw this over to you as well, Bruce. I want to make sure I'm understanding the question correctly. Yeah, no, I think that you've got it there. And so I think the two parts might be uh, you have to enable the frontline agent with uh, knowledge management systems that actually give them the information that they need or if they happen to be handling uh, emails that they can have sort of the prepackaged chunks that they yep. can use efficiently, right, but that's yep. also accurate. And on the other hand, give them the empowerment to uh, customize as necessary. So if you can do both of those things, then you can keep your cost down and still de uh, deliver that uh, belovedness creating <laughs> service that uh, that I think we're looking to do here. So I, I think you I think you got the uh, the sense of the question here. Yep. Um, I, okay, can I add great. in here, a lot of people think this customer-focused stuff is kind of, you know, kumbaya, we are the world, you know, let's just tell everyone they can do whatever they want. But but it's really deliberate. You know, these companies spend two to three times the amount on training that others do. They're mm -hmm. much more deliberate about who they hire and the selection process. So they make sure that they're hiring people that they want to be part of the story of their company long term. They prepare them, they enable them with tools and processes, and then they believe them. It's not just, hey, come on off the street, do whatever you want. You know, I mean, right. there are really deliberate things that have to happen. Exactly. And so, for instance, scripting in that, in that kind of uh, context can be useful because the people you know how to use it properly and not how to misuse it. So. Well, that's great. Uh, Brian, I, I think you've got more questions here. they piling up I sure on do. It? I sure <laughs> do. Uh, here's another one for you guys. And, uh, boy, isn't social media a hot topic these days? So this is a good one. Uh, this yep. is from Mary, and she asks, my company wants to use social media. 
but we are concerned with the possibility of random people writing unkind things. We could always delete poster comments like that, but could we still have a spirit of belief if we did that? Gosh, I'd love to take that one if that's okay with you, Bruce. Absolutely. You know, Mary, thanks for that question. What's important about the negative comment is that you've allowed it to show up. Because in in a world of social media and word of mouth, what customers want to see is transparency. You know, again, this goes back to is this a place you'd send your grandmother? Is this an environment that you'd want to go work yourself? And if, you know, those negative comments, especially in social media, also give us an opportunity to respond to that with you know completely open in fact there's a, a company you might want to go check out it's called customink.com it's a smaller company they sell t-shirts probably you know 20 million dollars of t-shirts or whatever a year um but it's for you know your grandpa's 100th birthday or whatever but what they do which is brilliant and right into this this category you're talking about is after every purchase they send the customer one or two question survey and your answers to that survey, as you type them, go directly to the home page of their website, completely unedited, because they want their future customers to hear the words of their current customers, and they're willing to show everything, good, bad, indifferent, and respond to that. And, and it's driven like you know, 300% growth for them over the last four or five years. Mm, wow, that's big. And, and, of course, it acknowledges something, doesn't it, that with social media being so pervasive now and being so open, uh, trying to control that is impossible. Right. So you might as well channel it and sort of put it in your own organization's face, and that way it can – it will drive change and uh, and improvement certainly quicker, I would think. Well, and we've seen examples of companies trying to control it, and it, it comes back and bites them, right? We can't yep. – this, this is not an environment anymore where you can hide that stuff. Right, right, absolutely. Okay, great, great answer to that. Uh, Brian, do you have any other questions here? I sure do. Maybe we can uh, This we one can comes one from – yeah, this one, uh, let's see, we're doing pretty good, 1032. I think we're uh, going to get a couple more in. This is from Stan, and he asks, sometimes it seems more profitable for my position and my company to give less to the customer in order to create shareholder value. Any deviation from that is frowned upon, partially because money is really tight. Tough times mm. right now. Any advice? Yep. Okay. Well, I've uh, sort of already uh, weighed in on that. Would, would you like to add something to that, uh to, to that, Jean? Well, you know, I, I, I think the whole notion of what is shareholder value starts to get mucked up a little bit. You know, shareholder value is is derived from growing the value of customers as the asset of the business. And it's exactly. also derived from not having to continuously recruit and hire employees because you've got employees that are leaving. And, and I think that the biggest thing is that it's incumbent on organizations to draw the connection between the growth of customers as the asset of the business and at a call center, for example, how you help impact the growth of that asset so that people see that there's a clear line of sight between what you're doing and what impacts shareholder value. Somewhere that gets lost in the middle, and, and it, I'm on a crusade to, to, connect, to connect those dots. Okay, well, we're uh, we're right there with you on the crusade, and, and one of the things that uh, we do in our, our little way is to make sure that uh, people understand what kinds of metrics are realistic. So, for instance, uh, agent turnover, uh, what can you get that down to realistically within your industry, within your geographical area, et cetera, and, uh, and, and try to make it uh, one of your goals to, to bring that down. And, oh, by the way, people forget, that it can cost six, seven, eight thousand dollars for every uh, person who leaves you in terms of recruiting costs and screening and uh, training and getting them up to speed and that you know that six months before they're totally productive, et cetera. Uh, and the same thing with other metrics that uh, if you can see how you're doing compared to others and then connect it to processes and then uh, monetize those processes in terms of uh, you know how much is it costing you to do that. You end up with uh, better quality, uh, more loyal customers, and hopefully customers who think of you as a beloved company and at the same time, you know, uh, keeping on the right side of your, your, your financial people. So um, great. Uh, do we have time for one more, Brian? 
Yeah, and actually, I'll tell you what, I've got a uh, someone on the line looks like they're raising their hand, so I want to get to them. But while I'm doing that, you guys can help here. Um, you know, this is really good what we've talked about today, and this is a real good take home. Jennifer asks, how can I express some of these ideas to upper management? I think this would really help my company. So what do you guys think of that? Okay. Uh, Jane, why don't you take that one too? Sure. You know, I, I, the, the first thing that, that I do um, – with companies is this it's a very very simple thing and i call it customer math and the the great thing about this is i found you know when i was leading call centers is if you can engage with your cfo somebody like bruce in his old old world um and then <laughs> the marketing folks or whoever's running the customer databases and partner and start yeah. to give a really simple picture of two things incoming customers volume and value or just start with the, the counts of incoming customers and then lost customers. Mm -hmm. And then maybe because you've got some call center uh, uh, folks there who can make some outbound calls as well, call, call some of those lost customers. And now what you can do is paint a very clear, compelling, and simple description of, look, we are in many in, – and in many companies what I see is treading water because – you're losing as many customers as you're gaining. So you're spending all this additional money on a quarterly, monthly, whatever basis, just getting new customers in the door. And then when uh -huh. you call the lost customers, you can say, and here are the reasons why they're leaving. And by the way, correlate that also to the trending and tracking of your complaints. And uh -huh. now you are a powerhouse of information. You're attaching it to the ROI of the business and connecting it directly to things that they care about. And just that simplicity, and, and I could say more, but I just want to stop there, really we found gets us traction where we haven't seen it before. Simple okay, no, great. Great, great message there. I think that uh, the churn uh, and, you know, statistics show time and again that it's much less expensive to uh, keep and satisfy an existing customer uh, than to try to get new ones. And yet so many companies uh, just uh, engage in this churn that's very, very expensive. Okay, Brian, you've got a uh, caller for us, right? Yes, I do. I'd like to introduce Christy. She's from Pennsylvania in the healthcare industry. Christy, you are live on Call Talk. What's your question today? My question's in regard to the social media comments and the transparency. We come from a healthcare environment, and obviously with HIPAA restrictions and things like that, I was curious what recommendations you would have in that type of an environment. Okay. You want to jump in, Bruce? I'll add to you. Hi, Christy. Hello. Hi, Christy. Okay. Sure. No, I'll, I'll uh, be happy to weigh in on that, and then uh, you can add uh, whatever you'd like to. But, uh, Christy, you know, it's a, it's a great question, and I think that uh, one of the things that happens with social media is that it's people talking about themselves or people that they know. And so uh, they're obviously not necessarily constrained by the HIPAA uh, requirements. You are. So <laughs> it's not exactly. a, a level playing field. <laughs> exactly. So uh, the thing is that uh, what you can do is gather that information. There's certainly no law against your gathering and using that information. Uh, what uh, is, is uh, problematic is if you try to, uh, quote, unquote, fight back or quote, quote, try to inform back, which might be a, net, a better way of doing it, um, by putting you know, your own answers out into the social media world, uh, you'd have to depersonalize those totally, and that may be difficult to do. Uh, so you're going to have to you you are going to be uh, fighting the battle a little bit with one arm behind your back in terms of any negative sentiments that come out, uh, and you're going to have to deal with that through uh, gathering the information, trying to make it better, going back to the individual rather than to the whole community, and uh, trying to see if you can get the individual to uh, themselves. Uh, under their rubric and not yours, uh, to say good things where they may have said bad things before. If I could just tell a quick story, there's a story circulating about somebody in line uh, at a uh, uh, rental car agency, and they used some keywords that were picked up by the company's uh, social media area. Uh, you know, I hate, and then the name of the company, and uh, this was picked up and immediately turned around they, because of the fact they were in line for so long. Uh, the company got in touch with the office in Boston because that's where the person said they were, said put some more people on the line there, and please ask uh, Mr. Smith 
uh, if they can be helped because we want to turn him around. Well, uh, they did that, and Mr. Smith started tweeting positive things about the company immediately. You know, it was like, wow, are they listening or what? Now, in that case, the person didn't mind, if you will, that their exactly. privacy, if you want to call it that, but they, they, you kind of give up the presumption of privacy when you're, when you're tweeting. But uh, they, that, that was really good. You can't necessarily do that, so uh, you're going to have to be a little careful. Uh, with that one, I, I, I turn it over to Jean for her thoughts. Yeah, you know, I would agree. I I understand the whole HIPAA requirements and things. And what I would use it as, at least in the, at least initially, is an amazing listening portal. You know, you've got an opportunity to see real time what your customer sentiments are about your company, your processes, your operations, and combine that, for example, with what you're collecting at the at, at your call centers and, and just use that as more ammunition on what things you need to change. And if there are some things where, you know, it doesn't get in the way, respond online to customers. But, you know, you've got to kind of tiptoe your way into that, I, I understand. But but at the very least, there's many, many uh, applications and companies that can help you scrape that social media feedback on a regular basis and organize it for you so it's a really, really important and potent source of, of real-time and passionate customer information. We actually get so so much granularity when customers talk to each other that we sometimes don't get in survey reports. So maybe that's a great way to, to think about and to start with that really important social media information. Yeah. Now, Christy, is there is there more to your question? Have we answered it, or is there a further question that you'd like to ask us? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay, well, thank you very much for your question. Appreciate it. Okay. Brian, uh, I think we might be at the end of our our uh, – our time here, actually, we're beyond the end, but it's been a great, great show. Is there any more that you'd like to bring on, any uh, uh, telephoners, or, or should we end it here? Uh, no, I, we've, uh, I think we're there for telephone. I do have a quick one if we can get it in. Uh, this is from Jay uh, Knowlton. says, Hi, I work for Starwood Hotels, and we are very proactive on Facebook and Twitter, too. Customer feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. So I think he's more of just a, a comment into our show. So thank you, Jay. But uh, that's it for right mm -hmm. now. Bruce, if you guys want to wrap things up or add any last comments, go for it. Okay. Well, listen, I'd like to uh, thank Gene very much for a very lively show and uh, also for all of our callers and listeners for, for uh, joining us. And um, with that, uh, Gene, did you have any final, final uh, thoughts? No, I just, you know, I, I think it's so important what the, what the folks that talk to customers are doing. They really are uh, the memory creators and uh, such, such an important and powerful part of the brand experience. So I, I, I really, um, my hat's off, and anything we can do to help, we're here for you. Okay, great, great. Over to you then, Brian. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks again, Gene Bliss. Appreciate it. Uh, and, of course, Bruce Belfiore, our host of CallTalk.tv. Have some winners today, so listen up. David, Leslie, and Christy, you three are winners today, and uh, you just want a free in-depth reality check valued at $1,500. Uh, and also today, thank you, Gene, for this. We're going to get you a copy of Gene Bliss's book, I Love You More Than My Dog. So, David, Leslie, and Christy, if you're listening live, make sure you email me at brian at benchmarkportal.com so I can get that to you. That's brian at benchmarkportal.com. So, of course, I want to thank everyone for listening in on the show, whether you're listening live or as an archived uh, show for us. I want to make sure you uh, know that you can go to more Call Talk at calltalk.tv. And uh, at this point, if we used your question today, you can also email me at brian at benchmarkportal.com, and uh, we'll get you a free book from Bruce, Benchmarking at its Best. So don't forget to sign up for a free reality check benchmark report and see how your call center does and compared to others in the industry. So that's going to pretty much wrap it up for us today. I hope everyone enjoyed the show, and we look forward to seeing you on November 10th for our next call talk titled Hold Time and Transfers, a Balancing Act You Can Win. That's going to wrap it up for us here at Call Talk. Hi, everyone. Have a great day.